Okay, I think that uh, we can start uh, this uh, focus session. Um, I'm René Grel from IEEE France and IEEE overall. And uh, this uh, week starts with he says as follow up of uh, last week uh, workshop, uh, uh, which was uh, dedicated to the, the ten UN decade challenges and uh, the project associated with and the best practices uh, that could uh, that were <clears throat> uh, derived from these projects. Uh, so this focus session here is dedicated uh, on the digital twin of the ocean and will be introduced and uh, led by Isam. So uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, that uh, not only D DTO, it's also the experiences and best practices associated because it is a complete uh, package, I would say, uh, of the workshop. So uh, Isam, whenever you're ready to, uh, for introducing the different speakers and uh, the floor is yours, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Rene, for this quick uh, overview. So our session here will be about digital twins of the ocean, experiences and best, best practices. So it won't focus only on, on digital twins of the ocean, but also best practices in the digital world. So for those who doesn't know me, I am Isam Ashur. I represent Sparak, me and Dennis. So in the agenda, we will talk, we have like four sessions. The first one is it's an introduction and uh, a quick overview about the digital twin of the ocean. The speakers uh, for the first session will be me, then Benti. I don't know if uh, she's uh, available or not. Then the second session will be about best practices and experiences from other initiatives like Emodnet, uh, Editu, Editu, Noah's experience also. And the speakers will be Martin. And correct me if I'm wrong in the names. Martin Wiesbeck, Connor Delane Delaney. I'm sorry if I spelled it not right. So Ryan Berkheimer. The, se this, the third session, thank you. The third session it will be about case studies, concrete solution and best practices from Iliad. So there will be a discussion on best practices. There will be overview about uh, Iliad uh, outcomes and uh, pilot projects. The speaker will be Ute. Our partner from our partner from Iliad. Then we will be talking about uh, the citizen the citizen science in Iliad, our experience of citizen science science in Iliad. Then we will be by Dori, our colleague uh, Dori also. Then we'll be highlighting the integration of real time data. There will be presentation on highlighting the integration of real time data modeling and analytics and so on we'll, on uh, oil spill. It will be. Uh, presented by Georgios. Then I will be presenting the Mediterranean Biodiversity Platform, which is a web platform, and our experience in the Mediterranean level and uh, United Nations uh, UNEP map level. Let us, let us be so brief. Then the last session, it will be a debate and discussion and based on the experiences and uh, the outcomes that the speakers will uh, Will will uh, will present during their intervention. Intervention. It will be like a wrap up. Then next steps forward. And uh, yeah, this is the agenda of the whole session. So uh, let us start with the first session, which is an introduction, and uh, and a quick overview on Iliad. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Isam, and hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. I will start by sharing my screen. Yeah. This is good? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I will I will introduce um, Iliad, the digital twins of the ocean, to you very quickly. Um, so just to remind us what we mean by digital twins, um, it, uh, twins of the ocean. It provides a virtual environment representing the ocean, capable of running complex predictive management scenarios. Uh, but not only uh, what if scenarios. In Iliad, we are also talking about situational overview with the latest uh, information and also uh, other types of twins 
just to, to highlight that, that we have a little bit more complex view on what a digital twin is. It's an innovative system that integrates across disciplines, uh, different sensors, models, and digital infrastructure. A key word for us in Iliad is interoperability. Of course, it's data intensive, and to make, make it uh, sustainable, it should also be cost-effective um, digital twins of the ocean. Um, so the Iliad approach and concept. I just wanted to remind us all that the ocean is vast and complex. It consists of geophysical, biological, and numerous interactions between its components and human activity. And in order to reflect this complexity, uh, when we are talking about the European digital twin of the ocean, we are actually incorporating um, uh, contributions from uh, many European Union members and associated countries as well as like, like Norway is an associated country um, that are uh, developing, for instance, a uh, core infrastructure. I think we will hear about Edito later, but also various model capacity and implementation in local and sector or thematic twins. So this ecosystems of twins or components of twins is what we are um, what we refer to when we say the European digital twin of the ocean. It might be uh, confusing, but actually we mean twins, and we will come back to that also. So Iliad is partner well the Iliad partnership. So the the members of the consortium is itself a part of a uh, dynamic ecosystem that works very closely to together with other projects and initiatives as well. And we are ensuring alignment using standards, uh, APIs, and of course, the topic of today, best practices. And we, again, I cannot underline uh, strong enough uh, the uh, focus on interoperability. So uh, Iliad in a seashell then is um, about enabling a ecosystem of interoperable digital twins uh, of the ocean, and we are using existing components and resources uh, together with uh, adding more sensor data and also integrating citizen science uh, in both uh, citizen science based data, but also methodology and approaches. And what we want to do is to make this all available, both the citizen, uh, both the uh, both the twins themselves as an entity, components of the twins and data, etc., available on the marketplace so that it can be reused and recombined in different ways. So we are developing innovative methods to make that happen on a marketplace. And of course, we are contributing then to various solutions of challenges related to the ocean and uh, creating communities around that. So that's Iliad in the seashell. Just a, a quick uh, reminder, this is a, a huge investment. It's almost 19 million euros that is invested in this Green Deal project. We are 56 partners and uh, we are working for, for three years. So it's a very intensive uh, project we are embarking on. Uh, Again, it's a federated interoperable system. We have made so much investments already in uh, not only Europe, but in the rest of the world, <laughs> but in Europe, definitely. And so we wanted to make it, to want to make it interoperable. I will quickly just uh, remind you the pipeline, the data and analytics and processing pipelines adapted to digital twins. So you have the data acquisition, you have the data storage and you prepare the data, you do the analytics, and then you visualize and implement it in a concrete um, uh, tools and services. And this is exactly at the bottom, you see that this is parallel, exactly parallel to what we see for the digital twins. It's maybe more, it's more data intensive, uh, it's more dynamic, and uh, the visualization will also be um, improved. So never mind the complexity of this. I'm using this architecture. It's an Iliad um, logical architecture. And since we are talking about best practices here, uh, I want you to, to notice that there's a lot of components that needs to be you know, along the value chain, the pipeline, that where, it, where actors need to be able to understand each other so that we need to have best practices 
for making this actually happening. So we have the data source, you have data providers, you need to catalog the data and the services, and you have an ocean data space, and then uh, eventually uh, twins. Um, and you have the, and I'm also showing here that Edito, so the core infrastructure and core models or yeah, basic models are also a part of this picture. So again, uh, we are uh, developing the digital twins in an iterative way. And uh, you see the, you might recognize here on the right, sorry, <laughs> the left hand side, uh, several uh, well-known um, unit Copernicus, Emodnet, Odyssea, etc. resources that I, I mentioned we will be using. We prepare the data and we connect it with uh, APIs, for instance. And the APIs, by the way, also needs to be interoperable. And we are preparing this all the way to uh, to a, um, a twin. And on top of here, you see the 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 various twins. And as I said, we want to use we want to reuse components of these twins in new twins again. So it's sort of going in a circle. This is what we want to facilitate uh, in, in Iliad. Uh, we are using many different types of data from different disciplines, uh, different standards, different formats, you name it. And they belong to different data spaces, to different data lakes and repositories. And we, make, we have to make this interoperable. And, and use exactly what we need for the individual twins. So here you see the twins that we are talking about in Iliad. They are thematic, um, covering different thematic areas, but also different locations. So it ranges from, from uh, ocean and the new energy uh, related to the ocean, pollution, uh, oil spill, um, fisheries, of course, aquaculture. It's a variety of activities and a variety of, uh, of data and models that goes into these individual twins. And here I have, uh, thanks uh, using, I'm reusing your figure, Jay, I saw you were here, uh, that each of these twins have their own sort of architecture. This is a rough description of it. It consists of data, data transformation, and I've highlighted and, and visualization, et cetera. I highlighted here that best practices is an integral part of these uh, architectures. I wanted to show you that so that you see that each of the twins will have their own tailor-made. There will similar, there will of course be similarities, but there will also be unique for each of, of the twins. And it will be placed on the marketplace. Yeah, and, and the output also here uh, will go. So the data, the model data, whatever we provide will also go into the Green Deal data space. Uh, Yes, so uh, we have a lot of capacity building uh, included in our project. You see here we have the digital, uh, we have, sorry, we have the Iliad webinar series. Uh, we organize workshops. We have had a summer school. We are engaged in uh, and, and show up on the different uh, ocean related uh, uh, events. Uh, we have had uh, one um, webinar or yeah on on uh, best practices uh, ocean best practices in September and, and we will have more in the future as well. So these will and these uh, the material from all these capacity development or capacity building uh, activities will be put on the Iliad Academy. Uh, we engage, of course, with the uh, ecosystem around us. And here you see, again, several well-known um, activities and projects. Ditto, I, I believe Martin will be speaking uh, immediately after me. Uh, and uh, there, are the, there are several uh, ocean space, data spaces, sorry, data spaces and uh, repositories, Copernicus, et cetera, et cetera. Going from local to regional to global um, um, organizations and projects. And coming back to Europe, uh, since we are in Europe, uh, we, we, are tr we try to organize or to, to sort of pan out to the different um, 
in investments, the Blue Cloud, the Copernicus, the Vecchio, the Destination Earth, you might have heard of the Destination Earth, uh, and also um, Emodnet, so different um, uh, data repositories. So all of this goes into Digital Twin of the Ocean, and we will have them uh, in um, different regions of Europe. It will cover different um, topics, and it will serve uh, different types of users, policymakers, communities, scientists, businesses, citizens, and youth. So I just wanted to give you this very quick overview. Uh, and we are, of course, engaged in, in uh, digital twins of the ocean at the global level. And in all of these working groups that uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, um, will be mentioned uh, later, uh, we are having partners who are engaged in this. And thank you very much. Thank you, Benti, for this uh, well-explained overview on Iliad project and Iliad uh, concept on uh, the digital queen of the ocean. So uh, first session is finished, very light session. So now we go uh, to the uh, next one, which is about best practices and experiences from other initiatives. So let's start with Martin. So Martin, you have the floor to start. Uh, yes, thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, what a great opportunity to speak to you about Digital Twins of the Ocean, in particular Digital Project. Bente just gave a wonderful introduction to Digital Twins, so that saves me some time. And thank you very much, Bente, for that. And also, some thanks for sharing this session. So I want to speak a little bit about what the international program DITO is doing in the context of Digital Twins. And uh, Benta, I think, just uh, basically talked about the opportunity space. <laughs> Remember, uh, in this decade, we have much more observations and much better ocean models that we can even imagine in thinking about producing and designing and using uh, a digital twin of the ocean in a much more realism than we could have a decade before. So I think it's very timely and it's really only possible now. So as we heard from Bente, what digital twins are really trying to do, they're trying to connect our capabilities in ocean observing and taking that information, the data to a common space. And then we can use ocean modeling prediction elements to look at some foresight possibilities and then turn that into knowledge that can be used in society, I always talk about sustainable development, but you can also talk about the blue economy. You can talk about protection. There's many uses around that. And I think what we just heard in digital twins, you are trying to build a virtual representation for some real object. Digital twinning is an old hat in engineering since 30 years used for design, running operations. So we're just turning that mode of operation into the environment. And, and one of the critical things can be what if questions, but also Bente said there's other uses of twins as well. As we just heard, they're quite useful for many uh, applications. I mean, the science is always there, but it's really also for, I think, uh, uh, the governing of the ocean space. So marine spatial planning or ecosystem-based management, it's quite, quite helpful. They have a role in education to play. The private sector is very engaged in, in digital twinning for asset management, but also planning purposes and, and civil society, as we heard. I think what's exciting about twins is they're not just a forecast activity like a weather forecast for the ocean, but they're really allowing to optimize intervention. So that's where these what if questions sort of come in. And I'm just giving you three short uh, prototypes of digital twins. Bente gave some high level uh, description and I'm doing it here too at some level. A very well-known digital twin that we didn't call it like that is one that asked the question, what would the global climate look like depending on CO2 emissions? And that's what the climate change community is using. The twin that there is an Earth system model, it's fed and started with data, but then CO2 emissions are trialed out. And then the questions like how warm will the planet get uh, depending on CO2 emissions? I mean, that's well known to you. I think a more interesting digital twin is one that asks the question, what is the most cost effective option to mitigate the coastal impact of sea level rise? And here you're building a digital twin that is informed by global climate models and the expected sea level rise down to the regional, even local level. And at the local level, you have intervention choices. You can build dikes and dams, but you can also build sandbars. You can have restoring or growing corals or mangrove forest, or you do a retreat. And in all real scenarios, probably some combination of the three or four options will be done. 
And in digital twinning, it allows you, the manager, to assess what are my options and to find the solution that is maybe economically feasible, socially acceptable, you know, effective uh, in your setup. And it's very clear this cannot be done globally. It has to be done at the scale where the decisions get made. And I think digital twins are a great tool for that. In Europe, a lot, but also around the world, uh, we are much more looking for a, a green or CO2 neutral energy production, for example, by wind farms, offshore wind farms, that is. And here, digital twins can be really help us to think about where these installations can be, how tightly you can put the wind farms and what their production mode will be, and also co-benefits around these wind farms. The engineering community is very interested in installation types. There are different types of wind farm setups you could do and what's the opportunity there. Many of these companies have a digital twin of the production side itself, of the wind capture system, but they don't couple it to environmental twins. And I think that's the space that we are advancing here in our community. So what does it take to build a yeah, the, the digital twin, there's four elements. And I think Ben has sort of mentioned it, I'm just doing more systematically. First, you need an observing system. That means you need to understand what the ocean is. I mean, certainly bathymetry, hydrography, but also real-time information uh, from the region. And I do think that digital twins, as they become more and more popular, will also help to advance the ocean observing system to sustain ones. And there's interesting dialogues between private sector, public sector, uh, free uh, open data, which I hope will be mostly like that, but there will be some proprietary data. So interesting space around observing. There's no twin without a prediction system. So programs like Ocean Predict, Post Predict, uh, advance that. And I think we have ocean models. Many of them are more physics dynamics based, but they're increasingly supplemented with um, AI informed methods on the ecosystem, on ocean economics, on resilience type of questions. So I think it's in very fastly moving space and very important to build out digital twins. I think Bender said quite a few words about the critical element about interoperable data, about ontologies, about, and in some ways, what digital twins want and need is a democratized data world. The Ocean Best Practice team is very much working on that. You'll hear more interventions in a moment. But I think we also need to be aware of that the data that twins are using, the data lakes, if you want to say, need to be trusted. And so that's an interesting question. And we also need to ensure wide and equitable access uh, to marry various customers. Also an interesting question, but clear IODE, ODIS, the Copernicus Marine Services, eModnet, you'll hear of some of the organizations are very deeply involved in that. These are all critical elements. And the last one I mentioned is the visualization capability. At Kiel, we run this half dome. Uh, so we call it decision-making theater. There can be browser-based system, Jupyter notebooks, even 3D immersive environments. So it's a very exciting space in the visualization, which is another piece of a digital twin. Bente, you didn't go very deeply into it, but I'm sure at Iliad, that's also an arena where you guys are working on because these are the elements that each twin in some form needs to have. And I really very much like, Bente, what you said. All of these are there in some way, so it's putting them together. We're in a smart way, we're using some of our capabilities and enhancing them where needed. So very much supporting that approach. So internationally, we are discussing where we are in this space in Europe, we know a little bit more about that, but also in Asia, in the United States, in South Africa, Cabo Verde. And that's the, what DITO really brings to the table, that international space of discussion, interactions. And the ocean best practice system is wonderful for that because it's also international. And I think people are trying to learn from the experience that we have in Europe and what others are doing, and we're learning from each other. So the first successful summit that we had a bit more than a year ago in London, we had 80 people there at the tail end of Corona, but I think it was really an, an important meeting to get the idea even broader established. And I think we all benefited from that. And the second uh, summit is coming up in a few weeks, uh, November 9th to 12th in Xiamen. There's about 500 participants registered as of today, uh, about them of 100 from overseas, or certainly 300 Chinese. And it shows you that in China, digital twinning is also very actively pursued. And I'm looking forward to learn and see what we're seeing, where the community is advancing. The United States is catching onto the idea of some interesting project in that space. So again, at Xiamen, we'll come together and learn more a little bit about that. So we saw that slide, Bente, thanks uh, for, from you, uh, where we are working on internationally. So obviously we need to advance and make sure that the observing systems are twin ready in some form. 
that the, the capabilities on data analytics and prediction engines need to grow. We're doing that with the Ocean Best pra uh, with the Ocean Predict system. Data lakes, interoperability, uh, best practices, important issue, visualization, as I mentioned. But in particular, I think the framework architecture is something that Turtle and Iliad are really bringing to the table. And I think that's a very important component. We get a lot of questions around that. People thinking about what is a good architecture uh, to build a twins out. And I'm actually quite interested to learn what other countries, other regions are using. Are they coming on the same architectures that we're thinking Europe is the way to go? Very exciting. And obviously education training, capacity development is an important in particular at the UN level. So I'm gonna stop here, Isam. You asked me to be short, I am short, and I will come back for the general discussion, but I think it shows you how well it's commuting what we heard from the Iliad project and what we're doing internationally. And I think that's exactly what we're expecting here and ocean best practices will be a key enabler for all of us to make digital twins a reality and make them really working and, and successful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin, for, your, for this uh, overview about uh, and experience from Dito in Digital Twin of the, o of the Ocean. So we, uh, for the next session by Connor, I think. Uh, just, just before uh, uh, Seth Rene again, uh, if you have questions, do not hesitate to uh, use the Q&A. There were one question in the Q&A which was responded to, and that's the best way instead of having some in a chat because of very uh, a lot of uh, discussion in the chat and we cannot pick it and just a precision uh martin is not short he's very tall <laughs> it's just a joke so i'm connor delaney um i'm the technical coordinator of uh, emodnet and i'm here to present to you on our latest developments in emodnet and how they fit into the uh, concepts of digital twin and providing services to digital twins um I um, wanted to give you an overview of what's been happening in the past year or two years that uh, are having important impacts onto the service changes for eModnet. So um, this is going to be a short presentation, uh, but hopefully it will answer, it will raise some questions for, um, or topics for you to ask questions about later. So eModnet is a public service, a set of formal service of, of DG Mari of the European Commission. And it provides uh, data products <coughs> on the um, what hap what's happening in the marine and uh, coastal zones of Europe uh, and beyond. Uh, we used also started looking in the Caribbean as well. And the data products within eModnet are uh, that are published by eModnet are all Creative Commons uh, by 4.0. That means they're open data that you're free to take them and download them and do whatever you want with them. They're all well described by uh, international metadata standards, and they're served in a number of ways, i.e. like for web servers or, or direct downloads. Um, and up to this year, eModNet existed as seven separate portals, one per thematic area. We, we have bathymetry, human activities, physics, geology, seabed habitats, chemistry, and biology. And each of those um, them thematic lots or uh, um, uh, product assembly groups a focus on those areas and gather data from around Europe and from member states and from the private sector to create the products of eModnet. Now, um, bear in mind that member states are only obliged to publish data for their own uh, territorial waters. So there's eModnet fill, fills in the uh, gap that exists there about who creates the products for all of the European territorial area. And that's our job. So we have. Um, Benefiting from the unlocking of all these data sets, we have a, um, a, a produced products that are not would not be possible otherwise. Um, we in the big data uh, definition of, of, of the V's. You see, if you're if you know anything about big data, there's this definition of big data that respect that talks about the value of data. We're talking about getting the value out of data. For eModnet, uh, we are sort of the reverse of that. We've we've done the big data processing and we've produced the value products. Um, for you to build more products on top of. So the, the bathymetric uh, digital terrain model of Europe is made up of seabed surveys from all over uh, member states. And we do that processing to produce that product. In human activities, we produce uh, vessel tracking uh, products 
where the email that goes and purchases the raw data and then produces products uh, that we share on the website. And physics goes and collects uh, observations at seas to create uh, unified data sets that are available on uh, the EMOTnet website. Now, as I mentioned before, we were seven separate thematics, now we're one. And the this is very much the commission driving this to have first become one website because the commission was worried that uh, the products of EMOTnet were not being um, available in as easy as easy way as possible to users and citizens. So when you come to the EMOTnet portal, one of the key uh, pages in the portal is the map viewer. And the map viewer is uh, what's called a data discovery and download service. It's not a, ge it's not a geospatial service a ge or ge geospatial information system service. It's purely for helping you find the data products you want to uh, query them and to download them uh, for use afterwards. Um, and everything that's available on our map viewer is also available in our catalog. And uh, just to give you, to mention something here that might be of interest especially to our Iliad colleagues. On the left-hand side there, you would see each of the thematic areas, uh, bathymetry, biology, et cetera. They're all, um, uh, that data is not actually hosted on our central servers. We're a, a, a distributed federation. Uh, the data on eModnet is, is, is hosted on servers all around Europe. Uh, and the central services, the central portal, um, accesses all this data through web services. So we have one central catalog. Um, before we had eight catalogs, now there's one catalog. And this catalog provides all the metadata you need for the, the products. It also provides the information on the web services for connecting to the products. Uh, so you can find information there how to directly link to the products in your, in your applications. In this, um, we follow the Open Geospatial Consortium catalog service for the web uh, standards for the catalog that's CSW. Similarly, for the map viewer, we're using web mapping services, which are OGC standards, web feature services, uh, which are OGC standards, and also DAP services, which are an open DAP service from the United States. <coughs> um, the result of all this is that now our catalog is all, has been harvested by the United Nations from the GEOS project. Uh, so it's available on the GEOS portal, and it's also been uh, harvested by the Ocean Info Gov portal. And through those portals, uh, you'll also find the same information that's on the, uh, the central EMOTnet portal. So you've built the APIs or the uh, web service calls to the data are also there as well. So to just give you a, a, a brief high level view here, uh, um, I don't have too much to go here, but I wanted to mention here that, that how much we're focused on services. The, we're really focused on Ocean Open Geospatial Consortium Web standard, Service Standards. Uh, for displaying interoperability. Um, we also these, use these RESTful web services um, on, a, on a server technology called AirDAP, which is now used by ocean data communities all around the world. So we're able to uh, uh, interoperate connect between AirDAP servers. Um, so it looks from the front end that we're quite a smooth um, system. You just see the map viewer and you see the catalog and you see the pages, but in the back end, it's actually quite a complex technical architecture. On the far right hand side here, uh, you're seeing the federated system where the, each of the thematic lots will run their own services and they're all around Europe. Whereas the EMONet portal and the front end uh, is based in, in Ostend. Of course, the users can be anywhere. Um, so we, it, and it's only through the, through the use of services that we're able to do that. Now, coming back to uh, digital twins, one of the things about, uh, digital twins, um, in my opinion, is that you need to have a lot of data to do processing, especially if you're using the new newer uh, approaches of machine learning to, to, to get some insights. Now, some of the big data producers that we have who are producing open data is Copernicus program. Obviously, our colleagues in Copernicus Marine are producing uh, lots of big data. And the data set, the data ourselves in EMODnet would be, I would call it small big data. We're not as big as uh, Copernicus Marine, but we still certainly uh, big enough to cause um, to meet the, the need to cause problems if you want to download all, the, all our data products yourself. Of course, NOAA produces fantastic amounts of big data and, and also uh, Landsat similar to the Sentinel-2 program. But the big impact that's happened in the recent years is that the public cloud, I mean, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have realized the value of all these uh, 
you know, open data sets and brought them onto their cloud in order to attract users to their systems. And this is the, uh, this offers a big advantage if you want to do processing uh, because then you have access to the big data plus the computational facilities of these uh, organizations. So um, last year, EMODnet and Copernicus Marine got together and we suggested that uh, the services we have um, in both our uh, entities needed to be improved in order to meet the needs of the digital twinning uh, concepts. So we got together and, and received funding to build uh, the digital infrastructure, which we're working on now. This is a, a data lake, and the data lake will hold EMODnet uh, data products and Copernicus Marine data products. And users will be able to access this data lake uh, through either uh, web services where will, that will allow very high speed access to the data products or to be able to log in and use um, different types of cloud uh, technologies to do processing within the data lake. And this is the thinking here is that we want to bring the in situ observations from ModNet to sit side by side with the uh, ocean modeling uh, data products from Copernicus Marine and also the earth observation products from Copernicus so that people can use these services in in to create new products or insights um, from a European context. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Connor, for this presentation of Edito, and uh, let's say the big data presented by Imodnet. So uh, next uh, session will be presented by our colleague Ryan. Okay, so Ryan, the floor is yours. Great, uh, thanks, Hassan, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to hear um, what's going on, and I think we'll hear a lot of um, notes of harmony in what Noah's doing. So um, yeah, um, so here are some Noah's experiences and best practices. I'm a physical scientist with Noah. Um, my current role for the past few years has been um, architect of our next generation archive framework. Um, so this is a holistic archive um, being reimagined, it's being developed in the Nezis Common Cloud Framework um, and at the National Centers for Environmental Information. Um, so some motivations. Um, we have a lot of information variety at NOAA. We do a lot with oceans. We do a lot from uh, in space weather. We do a lot now with omics data, um, everything um, from the surface of the sun to the bottom of the ocean. Um, our current holdings in archive are around 30 petabytes. Um, not all of our data is in archive, um, which we're trying to move more data into archive and we have more sources coming online. Um, so you can expect exponential growth into exabytes um, within the next decade. We have 44,000 plus collections um, when this slide was together. And we have a lot of partners and we're a very partnered organization. And we also have a lot of users. Um, so we have internal users, like where do I reconfigure my constellation for satellites? You know, where do I send my cruises? that sort of thing. And then we have external users, um, everybody from the farmer to the scientist to the policymaker, essentially. And we want to, in this reimagining um, in this digital twins architecture, support all of these needs sort of in this in this single um, system. So um, we, we wanna answer these types of questions. What is this, this replica idea? What will be, um, you know, predictions and then what if, so simulations. And our, our definition of digital twin is very similar to um, what Bente uh, mentioned earlier. Um, our third motivation is developing this, you know, new business model for NOAA. So we're moving to a more interoperable, open and sustainable one NOAA. Um, some people have said over the years, NOAA stands for no organization at all. Um, I, I would argue that's not quite correct, but. Um, you know, we're moving in, in, a, in a new direction where we're having this participation um, direct, directly from um, people that are building things. Um, and on the bottom of this chart, you can see our two pillars of, you know, how do we take this organization that has been around for, for a lot of years, a lot of decades, um, and, and move it more toward a, um, 
you know, hmm. integrated system. So, and this is that concept of integration. Um, and on the top, you can see the DIKW pyramid and this linked open data um, ideal, which we're moving toward. So some of our efforts, um, we have active efforts in Earth observing digital twins, um, our National Centers for Artificial Intelligence, um, and this digital twin Earth framework specification. Um, some of our um, partnerships internally, um, we're aligning with this concept of the Societal Data Insights Initiative, um, driving constituent outcomes. That's sort of a thread that we're using to tie to these things together. And then this, this common cloud framework federated no archive that, that I've um, architect of. And we're developing that as a knowledge mesh. Externally, we're working with AIST at NASA um, and CNES and the Coastal Zones Digital Twin effort, um, the National Science Foundation and a couple efforts, the Open Knowledge Network um, Digital Twins webinar with OGC and a few different pilots. We're a strategic partner there um, or strategic member. Um, ESOP and ESIP and CIOS, um, both working on, on um, frameworks for uh, interoperability. So, so best practices, recommendations, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. This is um, sort of sort of conceptual, technical, but more about architecture. Um, assume an ecosystem viewpoint. Um, so, I think you know this was touched on in the, the previous presentations, but. But we want to create a federation of things. We want a mesh of meshes. We want a, you know, a, a twin of twins, right? We want participation because, because we have a system. It's an open system of open systems. We want to support everybody. You know, how do we do that? We have a lot of different couplings between systems, but we want to have tra traceability and trustability. So it's important to take an ecosystem's viewpoint as a, a foundation. Um, solution development should be approached through models-based systems engineering. We need traceability. And because of the communications framing, um, which, you know, Conway's law says, you know, whatever we build will be, you know, mapped to the communications channels that we've established. We must map our architecture um, to how we actually want the system to, to evolve. So that's important. Um, also, we want to define a process information architecture, right? We want to take a processes data approach. Um, and what that means is, you know, traditionally in SDIs, we have service architectures. We provide services. Here we want to say, you know, we want frameworks for people to build things. But how do we share framework um, product um, in a federated model? Well, the, the best way to do that is pass process definitions back and forth. Processes also provide some other things for us. But, um, but that's really fundamental. Another fundamental um, best practice that we found is um, um, agile reference architecture and, com and compute. Um, so you wanted to design an agile reference architecture up front. This is an example of, uh, or this is what we're using, which is an event-driven architecture. It has well-defined components. And you can take this agile reference architecture and implement it really in any system and know that, that I can take this and iterate on it, up, switch out components, easy for us over time and we can also federate this very easily and take advantage of cloud services and things and and then the last thing um the last category of things is supporting multiple dimensions of semantic interoperability so you know when i'm talking interoperability i'm talking about you know specific things like classifications schematic interoperability syntactic interoperability this deals with semantic interoperability which is really critical and there are multiple dimensions of this so what you're seeing here is, is entity semantic interoperability, right? There's this core reference model for entities. It's generic. It treats data as just bits and requires these semantic representation, structure representation, other representation networks. And you can build patterns upon these things. But fundamentally, then, you have this searchable thing where all your entities are defined within this, this interoperable data block. You also want to provide um, process interoperability via process provenance semantics, right? So we want to be able to use process as a digital thread to do root cause analysis, to be able to pass processes and run processes near data. Um, so that's really critical. And the third aspect of this is um, context semantics. So here you can see we have an ESDT record, an Earth Systems Digital Twin record, and it's been threaded through all these different contexts. These contexts are all you know, independent spaces, but they're all linked 
you know, this, this concept of process as a digital thread. And, and we do that to enable fair data, care data, um, API discovery, and all these nice things um, that we can touch on. And the last thing I want to touch on is, is this idea of a, having a CONOPS. It's really important. And what we get with model-based systems engineering is the ability to provide a CONOPS to building um, and, and taking whole enterprise or whole you know, federations of enterprises and doing conversions. So here you can see we have this um, system architecture where everybody has um, a role to play, right? And all of our systems fit in. You know, it's not a monolith, it's a process architecture, but you, but somebody can say, I, as a data manager, I can say, you know, where do I fit in? And I, then I can see, you know, I have a place in this, in this new thing. Because a lot of this is taking, um, you know, all this huge community that we have and sort of teaching them, them new things. So to do all, you know, take that all together um, and we're transforming an enterprise, but the last thing we want to do is, is this concept, address this concept of legal interoperability um, you know, where we know that our architecture works very well, but we know there and, and some of the best practices or hopefully all the best practices are shared, but there are going to be differences and there are going to be situations where, you know, I can't run your day. I can't run your process or I can't know the internals about your process or I need to pay for your pro process and, and get results. And these these are all fit into this concept of legal interoperability and really critically for us has been um, leveraging partnerships to develop these pathways and, and cross-agency um, interoperability. And that's it for me, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. So uh, for this uh, overview and work about how that has been done so far with NOAA. So let's uh, go to the next uh, presentation or next session, yes, the third one, the third session, which is about case studies, concrete solution and best practice from Iliad. So we start by Uti. Okay, I'll try to share my screen again, and I hope you can hear me and see my screen now. Yes. yes. That's yes. good. Uh, I have very little time, I was told. I will give you a very brief introduction to some of the pilots because I uh, we will also have in-depth presentation of some pilots afterwards. Uh, so this is uh, how we go. I can't see anything because all these controls are in the way. So I'm trying to remove them. Give Just give me a second here. Hide floating message. There you go. So um, we have a lot of partners in Iliad, and so we also have a lot of uh, pilots in Iliad. Uh, in fact, there are over 20 pilots, and they are spread all over Europe, uh, as you can see, and the associated countries. As Ben has shown you before, we work along uh, specific topics, um, and you see the icons for these topics on the right-hand side. So we, we are really thinking about biodiversity, jellyfish, swarms, um, uh, jellyfish uh, swarm uh, warnings, but biodiversity also includes um, invasive species from ballast water, for example. Uh, it contains or includes um, biodiversity assessment due to different habitats, uh, these, these things. We work with oil spill pilots. Uh, we look into other environmental monitoring, water quality monitoring, uh, plastic pollution. We work with fisheries, with aquaculture, uh, and we work with the insurance of these things. And of course, in these times, we can also not work without uh, offshore energy. Uh, and uh, that includes wind, but it also includes other energy from the ocean. Uh, and I probably have forgotten a lot of them already. So um, as in my head, I'm, my name is Uta, by the way, I'm leading the pilot work package in Iliad. Um, and in my uh, simple head, I have said we have kind of three types of, of pilots. Uh, one is uh, our pilots that are really developed by technical partners in Iliad. Um, then we have other pilots which are really driven by end users who have uh, who are a partner in Iliad and said we want a digital twin for this topic or this and that. And then we have research driven pilots. Um, and now I would like to share my screen. Yeah, uh, my change the screen. So let me give you some examples. So in Norway, where I come from, I'm from the center of ocean, and there we have an ocean lab. 
And this ocean lab means that we have put some sensors in the water and we want to, to use these sensors and these uh, infrastructure to develop new applications and products. And within Iliad, we also want to uh, use this ocean lab to learn how we develop digital twins for specific application and how can we use the sensors here uh, and, and to develop digital twins. So that will be digital twins here, but this pilot is also that we have here in this area. This pilot is also meant to test the Iliad products and um, uh, parts that we develop in Iliad and to replicate that in another ocean area. So this pilot works a lot together with a, a digital ocean lab in Germany, for example. So in general, we can say, that we are developing specific technical components and we would like to test them along the different pilots that we develop. So in this pilot, we will now uh, take the sensors from a, a node that we call Marine Observatory together with the node that we call Subsea Facility. And then we look into water quality pollution and environmental monitoring. So the data acquisition comes from the sensors there. Then we will uh, use the ILIA developments to make standardized APIs and share the data uh, in a very standardized way, um, add uh, ocean model to that and uh, add satellite data or whatever we need. And then we will define a digital twin, twin core. And then we use some, some visualization to, to look at this. We are um, looking a lot at, at small particles in the water column. We have just deployed a microplastic uh, sensor. Uh, and we had before we had deployed a camera system to look at small particles. And this pilot is, for example, used to look into, can we use uh, augmented reality, virtual reality uh, to visualize these kind of data? Um, and another pilot who's using uh, augmented and vir virtual reality is the port safety pilot that we have in Varna. Havana has a port that has a very uh, narrow entrance, this channel here that you can see. And so sometimes they have this, this mist there, so you can't see what you're doing. And this, this map maybe shows this again. So again, here we have data collection, and then we have AI for, for um, quality check and filtering of data and data recovery. And what this does, it, it uh, makes a virtual reality application of this sailing into the Varna port, even if the pilot of the ship can't see a thing. And how it looks like is this. So the pilot is then virt um, wearing virtual these, these glasses. And on the lower left, you can see that he can then navigate the ship through the mist with the help of this virtual reality. So, and this is developed then and, and used then in real time. Um, another pilot that we have with augmented and virtual reality is something that we call the wind energy project review tool, uh, where the digital twin of the ocean takes, or this, this digital twin takes the environmental data from, um, from available sources and then has a visualization of a loading um, operation, for example, to see, is it actually possible to perform this operation in these environmental conditions? Um, and this is very important if you want to assess, is can, can I ship something uh, to my wind farm or not? Um, another type of application that we have is fisheries and aquaculture. This time, I'm, I'm right now I'm talking about the fisheries. And uh, here we combine, or the, the pilot team combines uh, data on, on catches from a fishing fleet. So there is a, several um, boats are, or vessels are included. And this data is then combined with fish auction data and with predicted fuel consumption and um, for, for, the, for the vessels to go to the uh, fisheries area, and then this improves uh, a lot of sustainability, reduces fuel consumption, and and gives the the fishers the the best possibility to to go to um, yeah fishing areas for for most optimal results. Um, this is realized. This one that I'm showing right now is realized in the North Sea, but we have a similar one which is in the Black Sea, which is also for, uh, fisheries, and then this. Pilot, this specific pilot reuses uh, uh, this ship routing that is actually used in Crete uh, together with oil, uh, an oil spill and mid ocean pilot that, that is implemented uh, as an extension of coastal Crete. 
Um, then we have aquaculture. We have aquaculture pilots in several areas, um, and we also have aquaculture insurance. Here we connect uh, all data, environmental data that is important so that you, we can monitor and assess conditions that are important for uh, feed consumptions because feeding or how much uh, a fish eats is very much uh, dependent on temperature, but also other things um, that might might develop or affect biomass development. So this or these pilots are developed in Norway, in Tunisia and in Morocco. Um, but also we look into oil spills, which is a pilot, uh, a similar pilot that is developed in Greece. So what I'm saying is we, we are uh, currently developing a lot of pilots and they're independent of each other, but they are reusing uh, or in the future reusing technical parts uh, of uh, that are developed in different pilots in, in Iliad. And, and we, we want this not only interoperability of pilots, but also cross interoperability of, of pilot uh, components that Bente mentioned. Um, and I think this is where I leave you um, because we have some more pilots which will be presented in detail now, the jellyfish pilot and oil spill pilot and the biodiversity pilot. And I'm very much looking forward to that. Unfortunately, time does not allow us to like talk more comfortably in in all the Iliad pilot studies. So, so Dory, you have the floor. I think. Thank you. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I've had internet connection problems all day, so hopefully uh, this time we will be able to make it work. So I'm going to take you into the weird and, uh, and wild world of, uh, of jellyfish observation right now as an example of how digital twins uh, may, be, uh, may be used in order to um, accelerate some processes that were naturally organically evolving before. And now we are going to um, have them put through the channels of best practices and uh, interoperability in, into a, an ocean information model. We have started, my name is Dori Edelis, first of all, I'm a, a marine ecologist from the University of Haifa. I've had absolutely nothing to do with digital twins uh, before this project, and I'm uh, super excited to see uh, how the potential of, of what I do is being realized uh, through this uh, new channel. So uh, the way we utilize it, is we go out to the sea, uh, we have citizens. We This is a citizen science project, essentially, uh, that deals with observations of jellyfish. And jellyfish are a win-win-win situation for, uh, for citizen science and also for digital twins because uh, our sensors are human and therefore very diverse. And hence the multitude of challenges in looking in, into uh, the types of information that they produce and streamlining it and harmonizing and standardizing it to fit what a digital twin actually uh, demands. In order to fit the, the principles of, of FAIR, uh, we try to harness this technology uh, to take the information that we bring in through citizens and turn it into something actionable and, um, and useful. So we start with the youngest citizens, as you see Chaim there in the middle, uh, with kindergarten, and we go uh, all the way through uh, various types uh, of sensors, of human sensors, and these may be people swimming in the ocean, and therefore they will have their eyes open underwater, and your sensor will be much more sensitive than, for example, a person on a kayak or a surfboard. So we are utilizing all of them in different uh, ways in order to uh, gain as much information as we can about the system. The way we operate is uh, through a web app, uh, and the numbers are not as uh, impressive, of course, as Noah, Imodet, or Copernicus. Uh, and, and we're merely talking about a small country in the easternmost part of the Eastern Mediterranean. And what we do is we give the people a service of showing them uh, whether and how much jellyfish, the, how many jellyfish there is in the water, whether they are stinging, etc. And the way we do it is really by recruiting people and a lot of dissemination and engagement. And in order to bring best practices into the uh, picture, 
and uh, try to control for error. Uh, we use a lot of gold users who are uh, well-trained users, uh, uh, citizens that we have met with and trained in order to do this. There's online, both online and offline training. And this is something that helps us uh, validate uh, our data. We also use uh, social networks and there's a lot of uh, benefits for, user, for using social networks. For example, this new species of jellyfish that we found uh, through reports in social networks that also reported to our website afterwards. And on the other end, uh, it's time consuming and not always constructive. So utilizing different flows of information really helps us uh, understand uh, the, um, the challenges. And if uh, we look into social networks, we have tried to model the arrival of jellyfish swarms into the, the beaches through social networks and through um, citizen science that we do. And we see that there is a lag of about a week or two um, before, uh, before we actually get um, the, the actual uh, swarm if we use uh, our system and, uh, and if we use uh, social media, then you know, we get a lag of about a week or two. So, you know, we can do this, but the best practice aspect of it has to be um, through the, the collection of data that becomes scientific and citizen science data can become scientific once we have good validation. So one of the things we use the DTO for is to standardize um, the data and harmonize it. And this is something that I will show you in a minute. We're networking through a, uh, actually a network of, uh, of citizen science jellyfish observation organizations that we contacted them within the Iliad project. And we use sure. their expert opinions in order uh, to help us uh, validate uh, the, the best practices. So we, um, we use, uh, of course, uh, the, um, the OIM, the Ocean Information Model that uh, Iliad uh, is uh, is building, and uh, as part of the architecture, we use some best practices such as uh, PPSR or the Darwin Core, and these are globally recognized standards uh, for biodiversity data collection. If we look at the uh, um, the, the entire uh, bigger picture, then these are the organizations that we've contacted. All of these are in southern European seas. We also have uh, partners in Norway, but. They collect jellyfish data, and in much the same way that we do share it uh, with uh, stakeholders, either the public uh, or specific state stakeholders, including uh, aquaculture, uh, power plants, desalination plants, people who suffer basically from jellyfish swarms. The way we did it is we built a big data schema. You can see it here. Um, this is a small part of it, actually, that takes all of the, um, the reported data and um, looks at the types uh, of metadata that are needed. This is in, in fact doubling for, not Darwin for. This is the metadata uh, collection part of PPSR. And then you drill it down into Darwin core and then uh, each in each of these boxes, uh, you select the, um, the best options uh, uh, that are usually the, the lowest common denominator that enables you to include all partners, but sometimes you just select to omit some partners from the, um, from the process uh, or, or some data fields from the process if they, don't, if, if they do not fit. So we did a lot of uh, training and, um, and, <clears throat> and used some training materials in various languages for all the different initiatives. And eventually, what we want to do is take all uh, the information and turn it into, into standards. And if you know iNaturalist or uh, uh, even uh, um, through uh, OBIS, uh, there are, uh, and, and of course, WORMS, there are international organizations that are working with some of these best practices in order to collect biodiversity data. The reason we feel that we are in, in a good spot here is that we've been able to uh, contact virtually 12 different groups that are working across Southern European seas and ask them for their opinions. For, for example, I'll give you several examples of, of how to collect jellyfish data uh, in a way that is, um, that is standardized. We see that uh, they consider um, photos as more important than the personal details, uh, such as uh, email 
or, or telephone. And while they collect, some of them collect this, um, then um, they consider photos to be more important. Or if we look at um, the, the exact location uh, of, of jellyfish, um, the, uh, the pinpoint GPS coordinates that, that's considered more important to them than, uh, than general, uh, just general uh, location, the, the beach name, for example. Lang local language is important, the time and, uh, of day is less important than the date, of course, et cetera. So uh, we were able to glean from, uh, from this questionnaire and from uh, several interviews with the, um, with the jellyfish uh, observation initiatives, uh, what they would consider as uh, best practices. And using PPSR, as you can see on the right, is certainly one of them. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in collection uh, uh, of biodiversity data, and uh, if you do it with a, a human sensor, then uh, you, you have different types of challenges, like you need to boost citizen participation, and that's like, you know, greasing up your, your, uh, your sensor. You need to, have to make sure that uh, you have good connection between the scientists and the, the people who collect the data. and uh, that there are solutions for this, of course. Yeah, you, we need to make sure that the data quality and validation process is streamlined and harmonized. And uh, um, after looking at the way each of our partners does it, uh, we were able to to um, to pinpoint the the most um, let's say challenging challenging uh, uh, the most challenging practices, let's say, and. Um, how to use the the, uh, the data eventually, how to standardize it, and mainly how to fund it are, are things that we in the Iliad uh, um, in the Iliad project also try to uh, to resolve. Uh, dissemination can help with boosting participation. Using machine learning uh, can help uh, validate data, uh, especially when photos are concerned. Marketplace uh, and and using really standardized. Uh, ways of data collection uh, management and analysis um, are useful solutions. Um, give you an example of where we're aiming at. Eventually, we um, we already have uh, an MVP of a um, jellyfish uh, uh, swarm model that can uh, anticipate swarms up to three uh, days in advance and let uh, deci um, decision makers and different stakeholders know. Uh, that jellyfish are on the way. This, of course, uses Copernicus and uh, and other databases, and uh, hopefully we will be able to put all of this through an interoperable interoperable model uh, in the near future. And uh, we are really excited to be part of Iliad. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dori, for your presentation about citizen science. Um, so. Uh... Let's let's move to, uh, to uh, Georges with his uh, presentation. Okay, hello. I'm Georgos Hileos from Democritus University of Thrace. I will present you uh, very briefly the work we are doing with the oil spill digital twin, which uh, we apply here in Thracian Sea. So, um, just to show you uh, what are the elements of uh, the digital twin we are developing, we are using a series of sensors, uh, gliders, drones, or uh, drifters, or low-cost systems, low-cost sensors. We also use uh, numerical models, which are mostly coupled, downscaled, hydrodynamic, wave, water quality, ecosystem, oil spill, or dedicated to fish farms or mussel farms, uh, numerical models, which are able also to integrate uh, geophysical fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics. And all these are uh, in, in association with the satellite data, the Earth Observation uh, mo module, which uh, integrates data from existing databases. All these data are, uh, are led to uh, AI algorithms. We also use citizen science data, as Dori explained, mostly coming from networks, from reporting applications, but also from social media. And uh, from there, after the AI analysis and the machine learning, we are developing a platform which 
as Ben explained, is uh, federated, interoperable, uh, acts as a data collector and a simulator, and more or less as a control room for the development of the uh, of the digital twin and the dashboard, which gives the user the capacity really to visualize all the data that are produced. So the area of interest for us is Tracy and C, which is a very complicated and natural lab um, where we apply our models. We run high resolution models downscaled, hydrodynamic wave or morphodynamic models. Uh, we deploy a series of sensors in the sea, so you can see here that we have surface systems, also we have uh, ADCPs um, collecting water uh, currents or waves or uh, the tidal variability. We have water quality sensors and also we um, perform several missions in the sea using a glider equipped with uh, a series of uh, sensors like CTD, chlorophyll, CDOM, and uh, we also uh, use a novel camera which collects the, an understanding of the phytoplankton and zooplankton in its, uh, sense, in its uh, increment of the water column. So here you see the glider. We uh, worked with it uh, several times. But uh, this is a new uh, payload, so the CTD, the CDOM, the SPM, the chlorophyll, ADCP data for the currents, but also a UPV6 camera for plankton, phyto and zooplankton. And uh, our first results show that uh, there is a very interesting uh, feature over here at about 90 meters, which um, is uh, referred to as deep chlorophyll maximum and is a pattern really uh, which affects the dynamics of the area. But also we are um, very interested in the data from the glider in order to integrate the stratification, uh, a high resolution stratification understanding in the oil spill models that I will show you later on. In terms of oil spill, we are developing a series of algorithms to uh, identify the oil spill. And um, we are applying these algorithms on satellite images. We process the images and finally we detect the oil spill. Uh, this is the oil spill. It was, it was an oil spill from the Syria uh, oil release incident. We also use citizen science and we mostly utilize the information from Twitter. So we explore the sentiment, the stance, the aggressiveness of people as they post their um, uh, the, the, the tweet in the, in the social media. And uh, we, in order to test the algorithms that we developed, we um, uh, tried really to identify what is the stance and the sentiment of people in terms of climate change. And uh, we scanned uh, several billions of tweets and we finally developed uh, the biggest climate change uh, Twitter database, which comprises 14 million uh, tweets and it's published over here. Uh, now we are publishing a new uh, work, which is uh, how to use citizen science on Twitter uh, disaster classification. Yeah, so we are using the Twitter as a source of uh, any disaster which uh, the user experiences. And uh, we do that in order to trigger our models for uh, any um, extreme event. So here you see, for example, what is the percentage of the training size in relation to the reliability of the model and the capacity of the algorithm in order to identify the occurrence of a, a, an extreme event. We are running our uh, models. We com combine the wind, the currents, the waves, and we run our oil spill models. For example, this is the Syria test case, as I explained earlier, which is run by, which uh, here you compare the satellite and the uh, modeling outputs, but we also have uh, hypothetical models in uh, North Aegean Sea. And um, we are, uh, explain, try really to explore the what-if scenarios by running the models under various forcing, for example, the influence of the waves or the influence of the winds and uh, the different results that the waves give us if they are considered in the simulation. Also, the analysis uh, has to do with the budgets of the oil spills. 
So we are able really to identify which portion of the oil of the spillage is um, uh, removed from the water column as a result of various biogeochemical and oil weathering processes. We also run algorithms, machine learning and uh, AI algorithms, which give us an understanding of the a better forecast of the wind uh, conditions in a specific areas of the Thracian Sea. So we are training several algorithms in order to see which of the algorithms really perform uh, better in the forecast of the wind conditions in certain areas. As you can see here, we pay attention not only to the uh, minimize the error, but also to uh, minimize the computational time. So we select algorithms which are also, uh, which give us uh, a reasonable error, but also in sort of a, a reasonable uh, computational time. In terms of visualization, I will show you at the end of my presentation, the platform that we have developed, which uh, give us an opportunity really to visualize our data. And finally, we are able really to um, validate the model results with the satellite uh, images. So here you see several uh, metrics we have developed in order to see whether the model is capable really to simulate adequately the, uh, the dispersion of oil spill in the hydrodynamic field. So this is more or less the components that we are using in the oil spill digital twin. We have the event identification pack, which is uh, made of this, a series of algorithms scanning satellite images. Another set of algorithms scans the social media for any oil spill references. We also scan any uh, citizen science applications for oil spill records. And based on this event identification, we trigger the models, the hydrodynamic, the wave, the biogeochemical. And we also utilize these machine learning tools in order to improve the forecasting in terms of wind and the wind speed and direction. And finally, we run our model, which is um, uh, closer, as closer to reality as possible. We, of course, validate the model. We uh, aid the authorities in the response, and we evaluate this response based on the citizen science app and the social media posts that the users uh, upload. Now, I would like to show you uh, very briefly, the platform we are developing in order to integrate all data in a, in a single system. So as you can see, this is Thracian C. And um, if you click in any location, you can see uh, the data from the sensor. So this is the wave height. Uh, it's uh, the current data. You can see the whole time series, or you can select a specific part of the time series. And you can have, for example, uh, for any any parameter you can have um, any uh, for example this is the water speed of the sea surface and uh, you can see how this interval changes you can have the statistics of the parameters for the for the interval you are interested in but uh, the same applies of course to the meteorological data we are about to integrate all our stations with the same format we also uh, we also use uh, the data from the sorry. We also use uh, data from our models to visualize the currents, and uh, you see here the the hydrodynamic field or the waves. So we are able really to see how the we the waves or the winds are uh, pushing the water which of course all these are forcing the oil spill and uh, if i consider that there is an oil spill scenario which starts over here then i'm able to push this slider and to simulate the movement of the oil spill in the hydrodynamic and wave and biogeochemical field that I show you, and uh, really um, understand how the oil spill will move and how the system and how we will be able to respond to a potential uh, in, in effect of an oil spill in the Thracian Sea. 
So this is more or less what I wanted to show you through the platform we are developing. So all the data from the models, from the citizen science, and also from the sensors we deploy in the sea, in the sea will be integrated in a, in a platform like that and will be uh, pack, packaged as a, uh, a dockerized system that will be uploaded on the marketplace of Iliad later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Georges, for this presentation on oil spill. As we can see, directly like the use of data from Copernicus and other data providers in your pilot. So this is a concrete uh, example. So let us now get now to uh, the next presentation, which will be presented by me. My name is Isam Ashur, and uh, I work for SPARAC. SPARAC, for those who doesn't know what is SPARAC, SPARAC is short for Specially Protected Areas and uh, Regional Activity Center. Uh, it is, it's uh, an international organization which is established by the contracting parties and its protocol in the Mediterranean level. Uh, SPARAC is one of the key stakeholders in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, which assists Mediterranean countries uh, toward preserving marine biodiversity and uh, through the implementation of the protocol of, of, of uh, of concern in specially protected areas and bio biological diversity in the Mediterranean level. So a lot of a uh, lot have been already said about digital queens and best practices and so on. So I will be very brief. I will uh, present our Mediterranean platform, web uh, platform, Mediterranean for the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So we will my part will consist of three elements, main elements. So I will be briefly talking about the spatial data infrastructure behind uh, getting or behind developing our WebGIS platform. I will be very brief as you already, as the speaker, my colleague, the speakers have already talked about the TTOs and many uh, digital twins initiatives. So I'll be very brief on this part. The second part is like, how we use this Mediterranean platform. So we will get hands on just uh, a demonstration on the, this web platform. And the third part will be about a case study, uh, which is the effort or the result of three years project on identifying some uh, marine turtles nesting potential. So the first element is the, the tools or or the infrastructure behind developing this web platform, which is essentially for displaying and uh, displaying and storing spatial data on, on biodiversity in the Mediterranean level. I will like briefly talk about some history the, about the reason behind the reason of why we have, we are stakeholders, but why we have a web platform and we displayed some spatial data on biodiversity, it's that part of the exchange and the data that already SPARAC is collecting from the Mediterranean countries in the Mediterranean level. So as part of exchanging data on biodiversity in the Mediterranean level. So we were working about uh, developing a spatial data infrastructure. This project was, this uh, this work was done within the framework of, framework of project called Medgi Habitats, which is uh, aimed to map the habitats, the marine habitats in the, in the Mediterranean Sea and funded by MOVA Foundation. The name of the SDI, Special Data Infrastructure, is Mediterranean Platform on Biodiversity. And eight Mediterranean countries were inv involved in this and beneficiary also. And they are part of the Mediterranean. Uh, what else? So as I have already uh, said Sparak is collect was collected and still collecting processing enormous uh, number of data. So we want to collect all these data in one particular uh, platform. So so as like many of uh, platforms, they are composed of two elements, 
what is visible and what is in invisible. So the invisible parts, which is the set of tools that makes this platform uh, public and available online, which are for, for our case in the Mediterranean level and under uh, the UNAP map level also, we work with open source tools. So we like uh, store and public and publish data freely with open source tools and freely for, for, for the Mediterranean countries. And then in the left side, here is the visible part, which you can see here, which is the the front or or the presentation or geo portal, let's say. So here are like some elements in the back end and behind the, the, the screen. So the, here is some like tools we work with in order to like process data or, or collect data. So we use different tools, GreeSQL, for example, or GeoServer and GeoNetwork. So here is, I will just go briefly because all of these are a set of tools developed by OGC and in compliance with OGC standards and other standards of interoperability, which allows uh, data storage, data sharing uh, of, of spatial information. Here is the GeoNetwork, which displays and stores metadata, which is information on the data. Here you can see some, some questions that, be, that, uh, that are answered uh, when you walk through a metadata, for example, like the name of the data and so on. So here is just a brief view or overview on the standards we used in the Mediterranean level. So um, we work with OGC tools, as I already showed you before, the tools that we are using in order to get this uh, geo portal available online. So we use OGC tools. We are using also Inspire Directive for, for and ISO standards for metadata and spatial data share and so on. Here is just a quick overview on, on our geo portal, which is the Mediterranean biodiversity. Here we can like use different uh, base maps. Here, for example, when we want to uh, to choose select data, we get through the catalog here. If we want to select some typical some specific type of data, all the data that we have are concerned the biodiversity, marine biodiversity, like species, for example, uh, species distribution, habitat mapping, some monitoring sites, according to the protocol used at the Mediterranean level, but also which is in line with uh, MSFD, the European protocol. So here is, if, we, if I want to get more information about the data, I can get some info here. I may zoom in here if I want to get more info about the type of uh, the data, for example, turtle, which is an example of turtle laying activities. Here are some, some information. And we can also download the data freely also. So... So one of the functionalities here of this platform is that it allows you to display its statistics. It's, it's more static, and uh, like in the future, we well, we hope that we uh, incorporate more dynamic features in this platform uh, through like collaboration with other initiatives, for example, to make those dynamic stuffs. Uh, incorporated in this uh, platform, like we want in the future to include more like what if scenarios and simulations. So through establishing of collaboration with other uh, initiatives. So uh, after like now we will, I will like uh, talk about the second part, which is how we use this Mediterranean platform. Like this is the usual portal, portal that offers a variety of services. For example, if I want to select data, I just uh, just walk through the catalog, for example, or, for, or I, if I want for more customized search, I want I I go through a more customized search. I can search by name or by country or what else. I want, for example, another service that is provided by this portal. Is that I can have uh, that I have the, the ability to change the base map, and our base map also includes the UN uh, base map. 
as you can see here, we can it can be changed. We have also some thematic maps that are predefined in the this and installed in this uh, platform. As you can see here, this is a predefined map showing the location and the and uh, the distribution of the marine protected areas across the Mediterranean Sea. So we have some potential OECMs, for example, we have other marine protected areas across the Mediterranean, and all, all of them grouped in one thematic map, or you can you have the ability to create your own map based on different layers that you overlay with each other, and then end up with having a map that you have designed yourself. You have also some functionality, you have also some, uh, let's say, other functionalities, including help, or if you want to switch it to other languages. And then, like, when we want to get or log in, finally, we can click on this button, for example. It, it, this uh, button will allow us to uh, control this spatial data infra infrastructure. Through this button, you can control it. the whole spatial data and the whole maps that are being displayed here, you can like uh, control it. In this, once you you once you are logged in, you can control it in this interface here. So this interface has a lot of uh, also functionalities. Sorry for the noise. So uh, through this interface, you have like the privilege or you have the access to. Uh, control uh, data publication, data sharing. Also, you have to control uh, uh, on uh, on maps creation, maps development, and so on, or, so, or some settings here. For example, the settings, the color, everything, the map, the language, the translation, everything is controlled in this under this button here. And then if you want to, uh, to control the layers or add some new layers, or add some thematic maps. You can like use this uh, tab here. You, we have also some statistics on like uh, how many downloads or how many spatial data that being downloaded in this platform and so on, some other info. And then the users. So uh, we can control also, you have variety of users in this platform like before getting into the users we have too many users in, in the platform i want to to uh to uh, like to uh, to get you more familiar with the workflow of data publish uh, publishing that we use in our level because we are an entity or a, an international organization that works with mediterranean countries so we have variety of data source so we can get data special data from projects that we are involved in with countries or we can simply get data from countries that are that have been reporting its special data to us so we collect the whole all of this data so uh, we have a lot we have like a uh, workflow to be followed in order to like publish our data for the mediterranean sea so we have this is in french we have two scenarios so the first one is uh, that we, that us, for example, like the Sparac people that are, or data managers that are handling this task, they, uh, they like, they uh, collect data in this platform. And then after collecting it, uh, it will be like send it to send to, uh, to each representative of each Mediterranean country, which is called a focal point. So, this focal point of this or this representative of the, of each count Mediterranean country has to validate this data whether it is accepted in his level accepted to be published or not if it is accepted so it will be published in our in our platform and then uh, in the end after being validated by this representative which is the focal point it will be finally published or and uh, downloaded also it has the availability to, to be uh, downloaded. The other scenario which is that not us that will be collecting these data. It can be done uh, with an expert, for example, or like an expert in a project 
in which Spark is involved. So uh, the expert uh, upload the data or collect the data, process the data and upload it in the platform. Then also there is uh, a workflow to be followed, which is the focal point with, that we that will validate this data. Then the final the publication, publishing or, or, or sharing by the administrator, which is a Spark data manager. So this is the general idea of the workflow, like someone who collect process data, collect the data, then put it on, on, on the platform. Then the representative of each Mediterranean country has to validate this data, which then uh, in the end, it will be finally published or downloaded in the platform. So this is a quick overview on the workflow to be followed. And then if you have like follow it, the workflow, there are so you will figure out that there are many users, which are like the, for example, the expert, the national expert, or the focal point, or us, the administrator, which is a data manager, for example. For here, the user, which is a registered user, it's someone who just consult this web platform and uh, consult the spatial data that are being displayed in the, in the platform. And he can also download it. He has the ability to download this data in several formats. For the national expert, he's the one who can consult other national experts in his country, which are stored in the database and the platform. And he has the also the ability to create the data for create and uh, put his data available on the in the inter, in the in the platform of his country. Then focal point, as you can like uh, see, so he also uh, see. He has the ability to consult all the national experts in his country and validate the data that are being like provided by the, the national experts, for example. Then the administrator who has us, he has the ability to do to do many tasks. He has the ability to like create users, manage users, and so on. And um, yes. So he has the ability to uh, to create the, uh, spatial data and to create and manage uh, maps also, kinematics map, for example. He has other other uh, privileged or other key functionalities he has been granted to. So in the end, I will like briefly uh, talk about the case studies on on uh, marine nesting here. This is an example, which is a pro three years project on marine turtles nesting assessment and monitoring, which in the end, it, this work was done by, I would be very brief, it was done by MAVA Foundation. And its aim is to collect data from, from citizen science, from, uh, from other initiatives and from questionnaires, from field surveys and so on, in order to, uh, to get information about the suitability or, or or the human impact on the marine nesting uh, potential. So in the end, after the whole field survey that been uh, worked out and done, so in the end we come up, it was this work was done in Tunisia in too many beaches from the north to the south and also in Lebanon. And as I, can, as I already told you, it was a, a work done from questionnaires, different questionnaires and different beach surveys and so on. And with the use of indicator, we come up with, with in the end, with, uh, with assessment of whether these beaches that are being prospected, whether they are suitable for marine nesting potential or not. So this, was, this project was uh, uh, like done in three years and then uh, made available in the web platform. In the end, I want to thank you all for your attendance and I hope you uh, and I hope it is well explained to you. So all right, I finished. So let's go now to the next session which is about wrap up and next steps. Okay, if you have any, have something to, to say or
no, no, no. It's, uh, it was a very nice presentation. Thanks to all the the speakers. Uh, very interesting, very broad, uh, very deep. Uh, I see that on the Q and A, uh, uh, several I mean, seven out of the ten questions uh, have been uh, answered. That's very good. Uh, so, if anyone wants to add uh, uh, or to question to to some ask the, the speakers. Uh, uh, just raise your hand and I try to <laughs> find a way to let you speak. <laughs> okay, would, so I would the... like to, okay, Rene, I would like Go to ahead. comment on the question that Kyoto actually has said, and, and it's about the some um, that digital twins are a lot about decision support or informed decision support, and if we should think about uh a model about decision support. I, I thought a lot of, about this. I still have an answer to that, but um, I, I think that these twins for decision support will be very specific and very targeted towards a topic. So I, I'm, I'm struggling a bit if it would be possible to create a generic model for that, but, but maybe I'm wrong. So if, if Piotr is still here, I would love to hear his thoughts on that. Okay. Piotr, I think he has his hand up, talk. yes. <laughs> you can speak. <laughs> I clicked on your, I authorized you. Oh, okay. I, I haven't seen that. No, I don't think that there is one model uh, for everything. Uh, it was more like provocative question of what elements of this decision could be added or could be could be missing in our decision, uh, digital twin. So uh, what's actually needed to make the decision or what kind of decisions are actually made and uh, what's missing? Well, there are some like natural candidates like, OK, what's the provenance or what's the what's the model uh, behind or what's the data behind and so on? But maybe there are some others also, like, I don't know, some policies and the others. OK. Thank you. So, any thoughts on that then? Uh, yeah. Benta, maybe uh, you, because I'm still yeah. struggling. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, well, first, uh, Uta, you, I think you're right. So each of the individual uh, pilots, twins, will have their own very tailored uh, output of the results from the twin. I mean, they will use it very uniquely. However, Piotr, we just had earlier today, a discussion on um, data sharing principles and data management principles. You have GEO for Earth Observations, you have FAIR for all sorts of uh, data, and you have CARE um, and also TRUST. So in the, in the, if, if you, you might be able to put some of the elements of at least handling the data, you know, uh, using these principles, data management principles, could be part of such a decision uh, model, uh, perhaps some of the elements, because they will be similar. As I showed you, you know, the pipeline from uh, acquiring the data, collecting the data, preparing the data, analyzing the data, and then visualize or present the data, you could have the same kind of uh, well, com some components from the data management principles in the decision um, making model, perhaps some of it. There is a question from Pierre Pitsik. Uh, you're allowed to yes. speak. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the speakers for these great uh, presentations. It was very nice to hear about the ILIA progress and uh, learn much more about the uh, real advancements that you have achieved there. And it's especially refreshing to hear about these ambitions of uh, achieving the reusability of digital twins in general, as well as on a component level, which I think is, is, is very attractive. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how you see that digital twin landscape uh, in the future, uh, especially with regards to what role is science going to play, what role is operations going to play, and what role is industry go 
going to play um, in that sense of reusability. Um, that would be fantastic because I sense this was a very scientific focused presentation here. Um, so I would like to hear a little bit your comments there. Thank you. Okay, we can. Yes, I can comment on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pear, for that question. Very, very good one. Uh, and it goes a bit towards the, the comment that I had towards decision support as well, because like Martin said, some of us are, are building these digital twins for sustainable ocean management or for sustainable oceans. And some of, uh, of us are, did, are, are building digital twins to really uh, inform or support uh, industry uh, partners or industry players in the ocean and that does not necessarily go together well all the time so the question is who is who is paying uh, for these digital twins and how much do the people who pay for these and and give the money to maintain these twins how much value do they put on interoperability on best practices in these things? So I see now, for example, in Norway, that we have uh, smaller players uh, on the market who are developing digital twins, and they do that very fast. Um, but it's very targeted towards one application, towards one customer. So best practices and um, interoperability, I do not think that they are on the menu. Maybe I'm wrong. I do not want to step on anyone's feet right now, but uh, this is my suspicion that I had. There was a similar question, and in my personal opinion, uh, these these players will have a, a role right now because they push us very much to advance <laughs> very fast. Um, on the other hand, I think they will be disrupted uh, by by the yeah, by the community, uh, digital twin community that, that is developing right now and that are really focusing on uh, doing these interoperable things. Um, but I think to get from these research focused digital twins to these, yeah, I don't know, how did you call them? Industry focused digital twins or something? Um, of course, we, we need uh, proper industry players and the money behind it to, to operationalize them and to make them also sustainable in the future. If I may, uh, uh, in, in the past, not so long ago, but uh, many, uh, several years ago, uh, I was participating in, in a kind of a uh, special uh, chain group for the evolution uh, or the future of uh, uh, Oceanographic Institute, uh, including uh, in the, the part that is related to what, uh, what we call digital. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so we didn't at this time spoke about digital twins, but that was more or less the same framework of something that is a completely digital uh, 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 representation of the ocean. and that changing the role of the uh, oceanographers and scientists working in this field uh, by uh, getting more into directly into the data uh, and uh, and uh, by uh, circulating or navigating into an ocean of data to uh, some advance uh, at this time uh, means like uh, specific uh, uh, goals and uh, being directly immersed into the, the data in order to detect things and doing some other kind of science. Well, it's not exactly science fiction, but uh, something that a digital twin could allow, uh, provided that, uh, as you said, uh, the uh, company, the industry, uh, provide a very uh, easy, uh, facilitated access to such uh, representation and uh, that exists in a sense, because uh, I think in a, in a world of games, uh, the people, the, what the people do, they have the, uh, they are immersed in the, in the virtual reality and they play to things where it's very, uh, it's a digital representation of something. Uh, so that, uh, that the possibility that uh, by teaming with industry, if they see that it's a market, of course, uh, that's a possibility 
and when I was in this part, in this uh, steering group that was uh, projecting something in the 30s, which is not very far from now, or, or the 40s. I, I think I raised my hand, uh, Olga Peer. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I Actually, in Iliad, we do have uh, completely user-driven uh, digital twins, and we have more data or technology or scientific-driven um, digital twins, if you like. And I can uh, maybe point to two examples. So the... Uh, the insurance case that I know well is uh, uh, aquaculture risk uh, monitoring. Uh, they are actually that pilot, that twin is driven completely by not only one user, one insurance company, but a network. So there's a market there and they are they are sort of uh, giving us the uh, the requirements needed for the to create the twin that they can integrate in their industrial or, or service delivery so and uh, so that's one example uh, and there are several i think we have we also have some renewable energy pilots uh we have you saw the um the the port of warna pilot which is not an industry but an administration so a public administration which is also operational rather than scientific so I think, Peer, that we, in Iliad, we have several examples of digital twins, and we have uh, that are both representing, so early stage in an innovation phase, if you like, scientific and uh, t technology and data driven, all the way to driven by actual uh, end users, like extreme end users needs. So and what we are what we are building is an interoperable system uh, that that should facilitate and will facilitate the exchange of components from these various uh, types of twins. Um, and Ute, you can correct me, uh, but in in the Norway we have this water quality pilot, which is mainly driven by by data and science. But that pilot, so even if they didn't have that twin ready for the market, it's something the components of that twin will fit into the aqua risk uh, twin. So, and, and this kind of exchange of components, even across the maturity of innovation, if you like. So maturity from science to an industrial operational twin is what we, uh, aim to achieve in uh, in Iliad, and I think we are on a good way to do that. Hey, thanks, Bento. And uh, so, Pierre, do you have another question, or is this still your uh, old uh, end that is raised? Oh, this was still my old end, uh, but uh, this was a very <laughs> a very good answer uh, by by Uta and by uh, Bento. Thank you very much. I mean, we could discuss much longer, but that was a very good very good approach to it and and please don't uh, take that as criticism i'm i'm impressed by the different or by the um versatility and by the breadth of different applications that you actually cover there so that's uh, that, that's very um very attractive very good thank you yeah i i didn't take that as criticism at all but i i come from <laughs> uh, environmental risk assessment for example from the oil companies and of oil and gas development and and what always astonished me is is that it was allowed to do that for what just one platform even if we knew there were platforms in the vicinity but they weren't included so i think um and and that was a call of course because it was allowed to do it this way so if we do decision support with the help of digital twins i fear that if they are paid for by uh, industry partners or uh, these kind of stakeholders that we might end up in a in a similar situation that these digital twins uh, answer specific questions but maybe not all because things are omitted or not necessary or deemed not necessary or something like that but um, I I think it's our it's our responsibility to make sure that this does not happen because uh, as I always say, digital twins, the, the superpower of digital twins is contextualization so we can actually include everything in that area. And we have the marketplace for that. That's what we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. I, I think we're arriving at uh, the end of the session. I still see that a uh, few, two or three questions. Uh, Slim Gana was is not sure that someone has answered his question, and uh, I cannot find uh, something in the Q and A anyway. And someone is uh, was asking about a uh, comparison between the archi the NOAA architecture that Ori was explaining and uh, all the other details, so that. Uh, I, I don't want to enter into that because that would be kind of another two hour session <laughs> to do that. But this is a very, very interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the small answer could be that it a bit depend on what uh, provider you are addressing, uh, if it is Amazon or Apple. I mean, the one that, uh, that you presented, they all have their own kind of different arch architecture. So that's, uh, I don't know, that we uh, that will uh, be an open question, I think. Um, uh, just so that you correct me if I say something wrong, but everything was recorded and will be available through a, uh, a link that we will uh, provide later on, uh, including the chat and uh, and the Q and A. Uh, if I don't say anything stupid, uh, yes, so yes, that's would... correct. Oh, I thought you was yes. I was saying something stupid. <laughs> no, no, no. That's correct. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so it's very interesting also to look back at the chat or, or the Q and A in order to to rethink about what was said and and replay, of course, uh, what was presented. Uh, so that would be uh, available via. Uh, I mean, Jose will take care of that. So uh, thank you, Isam, to uh, to have been. Uh, the leader of this uh, of this uh, of today uh, uh, session and uh, and thanks to all the presenters and uh, see you uh, probably uh, in another session during the week. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.